and I will add some links uh, for all of you to review. Um, so you can access some of the other resources and information that JFN has compiled and made available to our community. I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Barry Feinstone from the Jim Joseph Foundation. And uh, Barry has been a, a leader in our community for the last decade and has made tremendous impact in many organizations uh, throughout the Bay Area, including the JCC and uh, Family Foundations and is now heading up Jim Joseph, where he has been for the last several years and made a transformative difference in philanthropy through your leadership, Barry, so thank you. And I appreciate all of you being here today and feel free to contact me with any questions or ideas about other conversations that we can have. Um, I wanna invite all of you, should questions come up, to put them in the chat box. I will forward them to Barry, who will facilitate our conversation today. And uh, you can send them to me as a private message. So thank you all. And Barry, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Uh, thanks, Deborah and Tamar for uh, putting this together. And it's uh, great to see uh, many faces um, and names that I recognize and some that I don't and looking forward to, to getting, know, getting to know everybody. Um, just a quick bit about format. Um, I'm just going to give words of, uh, uh, by way of introduction for maybe three, four minutes. Um, and then we'll um, introduce um, all the panelists very, very briefly. Uh, you, you've seen their bios, just, uh, you know, name and, uh, and title. Um, and then each of them will have um, five or six or seven minutes to you know, give their perspective um, and then, then we'll circle back to uh, questions um, that you guys have and if you don't have any we'll have some that are ready to go and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up around about, uh, around about four o'clock. Um, so um, I, you know I, I, I am you know Deborah had asked me um, you know just briefly to give a sense of the philanthropic landscape on a, on a national level um, and themes related to, uh, you know, how the, you know, Jim Joseph or others um, have adjusted, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I think the first thing I want to say is to kind of, um, you know, just roll out the time-honored line of, um, you know, if you know one foundation, you know one foundation. Um, and, and by that, the reason I want to highlight that, that line is, um, you know, I'm going to state the obvious. There is no one way to do this. There's no right way to do this. There's no wrong way to do this. Um, it is very much, um, very much uh, a moment where everybody, you know, has to be uh, has to be regarded as doing their very best. Um, and I, you know, and in that sense, I, I, I want to I want to invoke the the kind of Jewish value of. Um, of Dan Lechaf Zechut, which, which is about judging people favorably, about giving people the benefit of the doubt. It's, all, it, it's, the, it's the opposite of Lashon Hara. And in fact, the Torah teaches us that, you know, all cases of Lashon Hara, think the spies, etc., are all based on the fact that people weren't judged favorably, right? And if you start from the position of judging people favorably, you are inevitably, um, you know, going to have less Lashon Hara. Um, because it, because you're giving people that benefit the doubt, and the reason I raise it in the context of this is, there are philanthropists that are doubling down and doing some work. There are ph philanthropists that are perhaps maybe sitting on the sidelines to see how things play out. There are philanthropists that are um, struggling and working with the weight of their of their responsibilities to their Jewish communities and their responsibilities to the secular communities. There are professionals who might want to do one thing and their principals might want to do another. And there are people who are doubling down on local needs and there are people who are only doing national things and so on and so forth. Um, so I wanted to state that as, as, as backdrop that there's many different things happening um, and all of them should be judged favorably. Some will work and some won't work, but the best of intentions here are important. The second point I wanna make by way of introduction is that um, it's clear to me, and I've mentioned this on a couple of webinars that I've been on, it, it's clear to me that, that COVID-19 um, uh, should be regarded as an accelerant. Um, and, and what I mean by that is so many of the issues that we're facing in the community um, beyond the initial 
massive need, which of course is a pikuach nefesh, which is saving people's lives. And that's the first and foremost thing. As we move into the next stage of, of, of this situation, what we're going to find is that many of the truisms that, we, that were already in place are just being accelerated and are going to move even faster. Um, you know, my, 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 the best example I can give there, in the secular world, we've all known for several years that retail and retail businesses are, you know, are on the demise. Um, and COVID has just, is just going to make that go faster, right? So instead of it being a 10, 15 year play, maybe it's a five to six year play. I think the same exists in our, you know, I think the same exists in our world. Things, trends that we, be, that we have seen, that we have noticed, that we knew we needed to get our arms around, we kind of pushed them off a little bit. And COVID has said, COVID-19 has said, no, 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 you, you're going to have to get through these very quickly. And on a national level, that is something that we are hearing um, at the foundation across our grantees, regardless of what space that they may be in whether they be in the more formal education space, whether they be in the more, more informal education space, whether they be for organizations that are dealing with young people as the recipient, or whether they be about training educators, the consistency of we were a little behind the curve and now we're even more behind the curve because of what's happening um, is, uh, you know, is, is, is certainly a theme. And then the last theme I just wanted to, you know, you know, raise up here a little bit is that the, 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 the particular notion that anybody who says that they know how this is going to play out um, should only be, you know, and here I am talking about Lashon Hara, should only be, be called a bald-faced liar, right? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's happening. Nobody knows if there's a second wave. Nobody knows if there's a third wave. Nobody knows if there's a vaccine today, tomorrow, a year or five years. And therefore our ability to be nimble and to act in, you know, act quickly, I think has become much more, um, much more, much more important. And the challenge that we all face in the funding world, um, which is a challenge and we should name the challenge. It might not be as acute as a challenge as some of our grantees face, but it is undoubtedly a challenge is how much do we press down now versus how much do we hold back, right? And I, I, I don't have any answers for these, but there, there is certainly some sense that people are beginning to look at 30, 45, 60 day timeframes as something that they can get their arms around. And that doesn't mean that if you choose a 60 day timeframe that you should wait till day 59 to start the next 60 days but we're beginning to see people saying, okay, I'm halfway through this 60 days. I'm gonna start the next cycle of the next 60 days. So I can see till July 15th, but in June 15th, maybe I can see to August 15th. And, um, and I think that uh, some of the, work, the, the, the best work that we're, being, that we're seeing done by both grantees and other foundation partners is around this kind of staggered concurrent um, strategy and scenario planning um, because to, real do, to do real scenario planning that looks out a year, two, three years from now is a very interesting exercise of which lessons can be gleaned, but is fundamentally um, not, I, I believe, not, not particularly informative at this particular time. So um, I'm going to do something which I rarely do, which is I'm going to stop talking. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to uh, my colleague and, uh, and friend, Joyce Sisiski who is the Chief Philanthropy Officer at the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund here in the, in the Bay Area. And uh, Joy, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Barry. And thank you for having me today. I saw so many familiar faces, a few of you I'm gonna reference in my comments today. And I really appreciate how Barry set the stage. It actually makes me think about giving my comments backwards. Um, I'll start by saying one of the reasons I'm on this call um, is to tell you a little bit about the work that the Federation has done in response to uh, COVID-19, but also to tell you a little bit more about some of the trends we're seeing. So I serve as the Chief Philanthropy Officer, so I work in development, I do fundraising for the Federation, but I also oversee the work of our endowment fund, which is very particularly focused on helping donor advisors think about their giving. We have about a thousand, just over a thousand 
donors who have donor advised funds with us, plus dozens of supporting organizations. Last year alone, this group combined gave away about $175 million to 2,000 different organizations. So we have built over, I see my colleague Sue Reinhold is on this call. Uh, she's the managing director of uh, Federation Philanthropy Partners, which is the advisory, the philanthropy advisory arm of the Federation that we spent the last three years building out. We have advisors who sit on our team who work with donors to help them think about their giving. And just prior to this call, I had them aggregate some of their thinking um, about their experiences, which are you know informal, but tell a, a much broader picture about a donor behavior. So I'm going to include a little bit of that here too. So um, just to start, you know, at the beginning, uh, the, I was in Israel in the middle of February when uh, the mayor of San Francisco declared a state of emergency and immediately the Federation began moving to put all of our operations uh, remotely so that our staff could continue to work. We are considered an essential business uh, in the area because we provide the kinds of um, grant making funds that institutions need to be able to work in these trying times. So we set up an emergency task force. It's chaired by John Goldman and an emergency fund, which to date has raised about $2.7 million. And we conducted a needs assessment led by my colleague, Roxanne Cohen, who's also on the call. And we saw staggering needs in the tens of millions of dollars just through um, June 30th, really. And we narrowed them down to sort of two categories that we've looked at basic humanitarian and sort of social welfare needs, urgent humanitarian needs, and then needs of the Jewish ecosystem, the broader um, system um, of organizations in our community. And grants have been going out the door immediately, first to people, um, really focused on social services to places like Jewish Family and Children's Services and to all of our food banks, realizing that people are experiencing food insecurity, including in the Jewish community. And simultaneously, we've been looking at these um, bridge grants, essentially, um, and reopening funds to help um, organizations think about revenue loss, help them resume operations. And these are going primarily to camps and JCCs and synagogues, and you'll have a chance to hear from Zach about some of the challenges that JCCs are specifically focused on. At the same time, our endowment fund went to work right away. Laura Lauder's on this call. She's the chair of our endowment fund. And you know, endowments uh, in some senses are built for days like this. It's raining, it's pouring, and how can we help our community urgently um, and effectively. So the endowment fund met um, in a special meeting to allocate just over $2 million set aside for emergency grant making with a million of it already allocated. We are working um, to do that um, to provide scholarships for um, Jewish community day schools, Jewish preschools and camps. And that million dollars has been spread across the three. Laura and Gary Lauder made lead gifts to each of those and we're actually um, have been encouraged by a number of our own funders who've wanted to give to each of these funds. We have a lay committee that's governing the oversight of them to let um, families choose where they want to send their kids to day school, where they want to send them to preschool, you know, what kind of camping experience they want their families to have so that it can really be market driven, which has been so critical to this effort because like Barry said, there were challenges that existed before and we can't solve all of them and certainly not with one grant, but we can let our community members decide by voting with their feet. And of course, all of our donor advised fund holders are giving and they're doing that very generously we're seeing trends that more people are giving now than they would normally at this period of time. More dollars are going out the door, although the average gift size is down slightly, but grant making during this period of time is up 42%. And that gives me a lot of hope that funders are really interested in participating um, in urgent needs that our community faces. And they're also thinking about the long-term health of the community. So, Right now, those early grants, uh, we saw most of them going to human services at about a rate of three times as much as they might normally at this time of year or overall in the year. But we're also seeing from some of our fund holders accelerated giving, less requirements for grantees, more unrestricted giving. So trends that um, you know we're following on the national level too. Barry was and the Jim Joseph Foundation was um, one of those uh, national funders right out the bat right out the gate to say, here are ways that you can help organizations that you care about and how you can do it quickly. 
Um, we're also seeing that there are larger disbursements going to family members. So um, multiple generations are being allowed to participate in ways that they may not have always been able to in the past. And um, while some funders are giving their money right now, a lot of them are waiting also because they want to keep their grantees whole, but they're also waiting to understand what the market looks like. Many of um, funders are facing their own personal challenges. If you work on Wall Street, you're, you're paying close attention to the market. If you're um, in real estate and you have tenants, you're paying close attention to whether or not your tenants are paying their rent. So we're seeing sort of a mix between people wanting to participate in urgent human needs and taking their time to understand what the long-term needs are in the community while also balancing their own personal involvement as they, you know, kind of wonder how this is going to affect them. And I do, you know, I think this crisis is, is different in some ways than before. It's more like a 9-11 in some ways than a recession because there's so many ways that our lives will change because this isn't just an economic crisis. It's a health crisis. It's a social crisis since we haven't been allowed to gather uh, and travel in ways that we're used to. So we're trying to rethink all the ways that we put um, funders together. I'm going to end with just some comments about um, a program that we did here with the Hebrew Free Loan, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Cindy Ragway from Hebrew Free Loan, because I think this is just the best example of a partnership um, during these times that has really um, come alive. Um, there is a staggering uh, overwhelming need for urgent human needs, as I said, and Hebrew Free Loan has been very well positioned to address it through loans that they're making to individuals in the community. And over the course of the last year or so, the Federation and Endowment Fund has been working with Hebrew Free Loan to pilot a number of impact investing opportunities and recoverable loan programs. So at the start of this emergency, we were already working with Hebrew Free Loan. We had a conversation with Cindy to think about how we could get involved really quickly to activate donor advised fund holders in particular. Our endowment uh, committee made a super draw from the endowment of a million dollars. It was matched very generously by Laura and Gary Lauder with a $500,000 gift. And we took that 1.5 million and said, let's do a one-to-one -one match with our donor advised fund holders to think about how we can best support Hebrew free loan through a recoverable loan program. And let's see if we can, I don't know, maybe uh, hit a target of $5 million. And maybe this was in just a, the few days before Passover, get to half of that before the Seder. And in fact, we reached our goal before the first night of the Seder. And it tells me a lot about the willingness of donors in this community to work together collaboratively, especially uh, when they're needed urgently and in the most, it, at, at the most uh, critical times in our, in our community's future. And they're willing to come together to do that. So far, we have raised $5.9 million for Hebrew Free Loan, and that's a combination of these recoverable loans that I mentioned, and also um, charitable grants to help Hebrew Free Loan be able to sustain the work and to do it at full capacity. And I, you know, this just tells me a lot about the funders, like I said, in our community. Gary and Laura were the first to step up, but they inspired so many other donors to step up and do the same thing, even at the same level. And it was, it was quite um, remarkable. So I want to thank them for their leadership. And I think um, it just, it, it lets us know that together we can do more. And it's certainly in this um, collaborative environment, anything is possible if we can look at what the problems are and try and address them together. So that's just a hint. I don't want to go over my time allotment, but a hint at the work that we are doing together with Hebrew Free Loan. I saved that best part for last because Cindy can really give you color to talk about what that means. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to her and just thank her for the wonderful partnership that um, she's provided during these times. Oh, thank you so much, Joy. It's a, uh, I'm Cindy Rogaway. I'm the executive director at Hebrew Free Loan and I'm pleased to be here today. And I really wanna, it's a mutual fan club. I'm so appreciative of Joy's leadership 
and, uh, and all the staff and lay leadership at the Federation. It has been a really remarkable partnership that has enabled us to provide so much more support to the community than we ever could have on our own, especially given the particular circumstances we found ourselves in a few months ago. Uh, we, it was a vortex of lots of issues coming together right about the time that COVID started. So I will start by just explaining that we um, all of a sudden found that we had to cancel, like many nonprofits had to cancel a big fundraising event that we had scheduled. We had 300 people planning to attend an event on March 23rd, and suddenly we had to cancel it. So we knew our fundraising was going to be challenged for the year. We also, at that point, learned that our investments, of course, like everyone experienced, our investments, at least on paper, were down. And at the same time, we started seeing a huge uptick in applications. We announced early on that we were here for people in need. Uh, we were offering up to $20,000 per household for individuals, families, and small businesses for Jewish people throughout Northern California, um, which is our service area from about um, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo up to the Oregon border. And uh, we're also started offering loans as well to both Jewish and non-Jewish employees of synagogues and Jewish organizations in that same service area. So we were trying to let the world know we were here to help. And all of a sudden we found that the money may not be there in the same way, especially the real warning sign for me was when our 1100 existing loan recipients who had about $12 million worth of loans out in the community started contacting us saying that they may not be in the same position they'd been in of making their regular monthly payments. The month of February, we had seen $360,000 come in from our loan uh, recipients and suddenly we started hearing requests of putting people on pause for six months until they figured this out and we realized we're so dependent um, our business model is so dependent on receiving those loan payments that we weren't sure we'd be around in six months to be able to help people if all of a sudden everyone stopped paying we normally have a 99.9% .9 repayment rate which meant that at least people were in touch with us, but we were concerned, which is when I reached out to the Federation and had a conversation with the team at the endowment fund. Um, and like Joy said, we were already used to having this conversation, but now it was a little more immediate um, and had, it would have had dire consequences if we couldn't figure this out together. So we started addressing each of those issues that I mentioned and many of you that I see here in this room have been so helpful in thinking things through or making, uh, you know, large donations. I appreciate all of your support. Um, Laura Lauder is just awesome and uh, read the proposal that, that we submitted. It was turned around within really about two days and uh, both the proposal and the response. And once she embraced it, not only did she get behind it with, with money from Laura and Gary, but really championed the fundraising efforts. And um, it really shows what we can all do together. And especially when you have a leader who is willing to really get busy, roll up her sleeves and, and make things happen. Within three weeks, they had raised the bulk of that $5.9 million. And we knew that we could not only get to work um, changing, pivoting, so that we as an agency could respond but also know with peace of mind that we could afford to make really smart decisions with the applicants that were turning to us and not be constrained by the concern over whether we'd have enough cash. Um, so I won't have enough time to go into all the details, but I want to say that in the last two months, um, today really marks two months since we started handing out the the loans to for COVID related situations and I'm pleased to say that we have approved 2.8 million dollars worth of loans in just these two months um, and 78 percent of those loans were were specifically COVID related with other loans um, loan requests still being processed at the same time I think our story is one of pivoting as so many of our own 
loan recipients have had to do to make some major changes in the way we do business in looking at our loan policies and looking at our finances and looking at our own procedures internally. We at the time had eight staff people. Um, only four of us were people who could do loan interviews and handling that aspect of the business. So we redeployed staff. We trained staff on how to do these loan interviews and we brought in volunteers, former staff people who were willing to volunteer for us to roll up their sleeves and get busy helping us to proceed as quickly as possible. And uh, we also eventually had the funding to, um, to hire another loan officer. So we had to move quickly because what we saw across the board from the loan applications we were seeing, and as I mentioned, they were really up dramatically. We had been receiving prior to COVID, we were receiving about 15 loan requests a week, one five. We went to roughly 50, five zero a week. And what we saw was fear and anxiety and concern just leaping off the page. It was heartbreaking to read these applications, so many of them from people who had never had to ask for help before, who were uncomfortable with, with turning to the community, but knew they had no other choice if they were to, to keep a roof over their family's head and have groceries on the table, medicine, everything that they, they were dealing with at once. And many, many small businesses who couldn't get support from the SBA quickly enough to make the difference for their own employees. What I heard from a lot of small business owners and still here is not concern over themselves and their own families, but how they were gonna keep their employees afloat uh, and fed. So it was, um, it was a matter of trying to make every change we could make, look for any bottleneck in our system to make sure we were processing loans as quickly as possible. We have been turning loans around in some cases in a day. We're having loan review sessions each week. So if somebody turns to us on a Monday or Tuesday, chances are we can move quickly enough to get them the support they need, let them know that money is on its way by Wednesday. If, uh, if they need to take a little longer, we'll take a little longer, but our goal was not to be the bottleneck. So we have seen um, just an amazing outpouring of requests from many different sectors in the community. Uh, a lot of this you know from reading the news, people who are involved in the food business, caterers and restaurants in particular have been hard hit. Not everyone could pivot and offer takeout and delivery as quickly. Some of them didn't have the supplies to even make the food because they couldn't get the supplies from their, their own um, their own regular sources. We also talked with a lot of people who do work directly with people where they need to touch people like acupuncturists and chiropractors, massage therapists. Um, we've heard from a lot of consultants, coaches, teachers, artists, musicians, who let's face it, were not making as much money. It was difficult for them to make ends meet before COVID and now it was just impossible because their clients weren't in a position to pay them or their gigs were canceled. A lot of people in the gig economy were affected. Very few of the applicants have enough savings to really get them through more than a single month. Um, many of them had debt to begin with and now the debt was pretty crippling or they accumulated debt in the first month or so of COVID. That was their only means of, of staying afloat. And now they needed help so that they're not facing high interest debt for, for the long haul. So these are just some of the people we've heard from. In terms of demographics, I just also wanna say that um, we're seeing a lot of elderly people who um, you, you all know what it costs to live in the Bay Area. A lot of elderly people do not have the retirement, um, the social security, that or retirement funds that will see them through this period. Many of them were working supplemental jobs. We've had people in their late 70s who were working at doing demonstrations at Costco and um, Bed Bath and Beyond or people who were driving for rideshare companies or renting out a room in their home for Airbnb. And all of those options were suddenly eliminated for them. So they, they found themselves um, at the short end of that stick and needed our support. We are, we've adjusted our policies. We are being more flexible about guarantors. 
who back the loans. We are being careful to make sure that we are truly evaluating a person's situation in terms of both their need and their ability to repay the loan in a different lens than we usually look at it. Um, we are confident that these people have every intention of repaying the loans. The, what Joy was explaining about this recoverable grant, the 5.9 million is a loan to us and will need to be repaid in five years. We, uh, fortunately, they offered it to us at 0% interest and which has given us great latitude and, and freedom, peace of mind. We also, one of the nicest features of it is that the donor advised fund holders who contributed to this pool of money so generously made, made that decision with the understanding that we will only be obligated to repay whatever we're able to recover from our loan recipients. We will do everything in our power. It's our goal to return all, if not, if not all, then most of that 5 million, 5.9 million. But we, uh, we know that the people who are borrowing from us have every intention of paying. And from past experience with what happened after the recession, we really didn't have an, any, any higher write-offs over time. It just took people a little bit longer in order to repay the loans they took from us at the time. So we are confident that we're well positioned to continue helping people. As we often discuss, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon and we'll be here for people for the long run. So I wanna make sure that I'm respectful of other people presenting. So I will turn it back over to you, Barry. Thank you, Cindy. I'm gonna call upon uh, Amy Rubino, the uh, Executive Director of the John Pritzker Family Fund. Um, hi, yes, for the couple of people who don't know me, I'm Amy Rubino, uh, the Executive Director of the John Pritzker Family Fund. We're a family foundation located in San Francisco with a small team and a nimble process. I would say that our behavior has um, pretty much mirrored the way that Joy described fund holders of the endowment fund. Uh, but I thought I'd take you through our COVID kind of process so that you could see from a funder's perspective how we approached it. So our foundation invests in mental health and health care, democracy and civic health, Jewish life and the arts, and we can pivot as the occasion demands. When the lockdown started in March, we realized it was the moment to step up in some meaningful way with grant making. It was daunting to figure out how much to commit, where to focus, and what the magnitude of the crisis would be. But we decided not to let perfection be the enemy of the good, and to get going early. So in terms of our decision-making priorities and principles, I'll just kind of walk you through them. Uh, the foundation moved to get dollars out with all due speed and with the first round of grants in March and April. And April. We accepted that we had limited visibility into the problem and its potential solution. Uh, we allowed that we cannot do everything, but we can step up. So we were generous with ourselves the way that Barry was asking everyone to be. Uh, but, and we made current decisions knowing that there would be need over time and anticipated considering at least three grant rounds. This really helped us to decide we'd look at one to three months, then when we knew more, we would look at three to nine months and then nine to 18 months. So our first round was equal to approximately 20% of a typical year's grant making. And we have continued to do all of our regular grant making as well. Our first priority was to the medical community, to needy and vulnerable people, and to some coordinated response. We responded first to the health crisis and then to the economic crisis it has created. We invested most of our dollars in organizations which are current grantees where we know the leadership. But of our 32 grants directly related to COVID response, however, 18 are new organizations to us. Geographically, we focus in San Francisco with some national funding and globally specifically connected to our Jewish giving. We make some grants in LA and New York where John's adult children live. Our COVID response additionally included some grants to Detroit and New Orleans in order to focus on communities with fewer resources. And we um, acknowledge that our priorities will likely shift as we move from immediate response into the recovery phase. So again, um, just walking down some of the grant making we actually did. Um, with regard to hospitals, John's on the board of UCSF Health and it is 
pre-COVID, uh, probably the uh, largest single grantee of the foundation. And so we made meaningful grants there as well as to another, uh, a number of other hospitals. In the area of immediate human need and relief, uh, we gave in the Jewish community and secularly as well. So in the Jewish world to Israel um, and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee for the former Soviet Union and Israel, locally to the Jewish Home and JFCS, and then meaningfully to uh, the Hebrew Free Loan through the Federation's uh, Recoverable Grant Program. We were very proud to uh, participate uh, in that. In terms of systemic response at the time, in this first round, there wasn't that much systemic response to step into. We gave to um, the city of San Francisco's emergency response this, and the Silicon Valley Nine County Regional Response Fund and to the Mayor's Fund in Los Angeles. Uh, this is an area we imagine that we would get uh, go into in a larger way in the future. And then with our own grantees, our existing grantees, we uh, got money, additional money out the door for our ongoing grantees. We, um, we did expedite some renewals uh, and uh, we gave additional support grants we uh, loosened restrictions on some grants, although generally we do give general support grants. And we moved some grants from um, paper checks to bank wiring because of the COVID displacement. A lot of uh, people were, are not in their workplaces. And then again, so that was our initial response. I would say in terms of future considerations, um, we may increase uh, our support for those current interventions. We uh, might invest further in sustaining core institutions we believe in and we want to survive. And then we also are going to look at our actual primary focus areas in democracy and civic health about securing the election, in mental health about providing support for care or increased telehealth, in Jewish life about infrastructure and aid, for the arts, in, um, there will be triage for presenting organizations. And uh, so in summary, I'll just say our strategy has been to give early and anticipate the need for future rounds of funding, to be supportive of our current grantees, and to focus first on medical and immediate human needs, and later to address the impact of COVID on our focus areas. So that's us. Thanks, um, Amy. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and uh, before we get to questions, I'll have Zach bring us home. Zach is the Zach Bodner is the CEO of the Oshman Family JCC in Palo Alto. Zach, thanks, Barry, uh, and thanks. It's great to see so many friends and and just faces that I love on this call. Whether you're moving or sitting still, uh, and and thanks to the Jewish Funders Network for putting this together. I'm going to go quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for your questions. Uh, but look, we are one of nearly 200 JCCs in the entire continent. And you should know that JCCs serve about one and a half million people every single week. We serve 25,000 people a week. Uh, we have over 500 employees and we have 10 unique businesses. Uh, you, you know the, the business model of a JCC. You know the fitness center and the preschool and the camp. We have after school care. We have arts and culture. We happen to have a great Israeli cultural department. There's a Jewish life department community. You, you know what happens with a JCC. And in most times, we're an enviable business model for nonprofits, right? Because we're 90% earned revenue. Two and a half million dollars a month we bring in from tuition and memberships and classes and program fees. And so ordinarily, folks are really excited to look at our business model and say, well, only about 10% of your, your dollars need to come from fundraised dollars. But in times like this, we have been crushed. We've been closed for over two months. We're not bringing in any revenue from any of those business sources except for fundraising. And, and I just want to say thank you on that front because so many of you on this call have been truly generous with us and have enabled us to survive from the Federation and Hebrew Free Loan with our employees, so many of your, your own foundations and your own dollars. Um, we still had to, despite all of your generosity, because we're not bringing in two and a half million dollars a month, we still had to furlough 400 employees. We kept on ultimately a skeleton crew. We had 25 staff uh, that were kind of the essential employees. Every single one of us took a 50% pay cut or more 
And then we kept on another 75 or so employees that were working five or 10 hours a week just to do the online programming because we still felt it was vital for us to fulfill our mission and provide for the community this idea of online content. So we've been providing fitness classes. The ICC has been doing Facebook Live. We've been offering classes for the kids. And, and of course, the holiday celebrations like Shavuot coming up. Uh, we did decide that we were going to still provide health care for every single one of our employees, even the furloughed employees during this time. Uh, and we also have a disaster relief fund with, uh, with about $100,000 that we've just been helping our staff that have been saying to us, look, I'm going to have to live in my car with my kid if you can't help us out. So uh, we did receive a PPP loan and we were able to bring back about 80% of our staff, but that only lasts till the end of June. And then we're back at where we were. So I'll just wrap up with this. We, we're right now operating on three parallel tracks. Um, one, we're operating in the short term, kind of what are the short term decisions that we have to make regarding refunds, regarding HR decisions, regarding summer camp. We had to cancel our overnight camp, our JCC Maccabi sports camp, but we are still running the day camp. We just sent out an uh, alert uh, earlier today. Two, we're operating in the medium term. How do we reopen? What does our reopening plan look like? We have an over a 50 page document that talks about what we have to go through. It's, it's one thing to open one business, a fitness center or a school, or a cafe, or an arts hall. But now imagine opening all of these businesses all at once or over some period of time. And then of course the long-term plan, which is mainly my focus, and it's what does the future of the JCC look like? How, how does, in fact, what is the whole G Jewish community going to look like in the next 12 months, the next 24 months? We're looking at the signals, we're seeing a lot of uh, openings to collaboration. We're recognizing that size is going to change everything, right? If, if we have to have constrictions on class size and, and fitness center size. So I'll just, I'll just end with this thing, that, that this, this thought that we're, we're in the middle of the Omer right now. We're, we're coming up to close towards the end of the Omer. And, and this is that period of wandering in the desert, right? We're between the moment of an escape from slavery and, and, and before we receive the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. And, and I, I, want to, I want you to think about that moment we're on the shores of the Red Sea and we don't know what the future holds. We know we can't go backwards because that's slavery, that's Egypt, that's Pharaoh's army. But we know that the future is a big black hole. We don't know what's going to happen when we step into the Red Sea. And that's what our community is facing right now. We know the old ways of doing Jewish aren't going to hold up anymore. But we're not quite sure what the future holds. So it's scary. We have some signals that we're reading. We have great thought leaders like Barry reminding us that COVID is just an accelerator. We have to see what's been happening over the last few years and, and just think faster. But at the end of the day, we have to become a little more comfortable in this moment of not knowing. And we have to recognize that Judaism has something to say about this. This is Judaism's golden moment. We, our people, our heritage, our wisdom knows that we have gone through these moments of insecurity before. And we're going to have to dig ourselves out again and help a lot of people figure out what the future looks like. So again, thank you for asking me to share my thoughts. There's a lot more, but I've condensed it for the sake of time. And I hope we'll have a vibrant conversation. Barry, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate the, uh, the comments uh, from you and uh, from Amy and from Cindy and Joy, um, you know, illustrative and, 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 and helpful, I'm sure. Um, so I, I, I want to invite any questions which um, would prefer, if there are any, to just chat them to Deborah, who can, who can quickly relay them. Um, because definitely want to hear if anybody has anything. Um, in the meantime, if, uh, if and when that happens, um, let, let me just maybe just throw out a couple of, uh, you know, a, a question or two um, to, to, the, to the panels and um, to the panelists, and maybe I'll try and just kind of target them a little bit, um, just so that we can get a couple of conversations going. Um, so I guess w one is just around... Um, Hey, Amy, can you just talk for a second about the the challenges, if there were any, of the weight of a of a foundation that both has the the, the Jewish um, community knocking on its door, and as you pointed out, you know, like UCSF and other venerable, um, you know, uh, secular institutions that are also, and how you try to, you know, you and and your team and John try to kind of weigh that up a little bit. Um, I think that it is just a difficult, we could put all of our resources into saving any one particular thing that we invest in. Um, both John and I and the team and the foundation are motivated to give to the Jewish community and to give 
um, to the focus areas that we have. I would say that um, what that the first round, the medical response and the human needs response, about half of the human needs response was went to the Jewish world through JDC, through Hebrew Free Loan, and through the other organizations. Um, we did make grants to this to the synagogue and JCC and um, the kind of um, entity ecosystem of our Jewish grantees that we would normally support and gave some increased funds as well. But um, it is a tension that, but I would say that um, some of the organizational institutional issues that Zach is raising um, and that I think that you yourself are focused on are a second round for us. I, I would say that, um, that trying to think about how to sustain the infrastructure of the Jewish community uh, came after how to get um, food and rent uh, to individuals. Thanks, thanks, Amy. Um, if I can maybe just turn the next question um, to, 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 to Cindy and Zach and Joy and anybody can feel free to just jump in. Um, you know, the, you know, somebody's asked a question which is certainly kind of, I think, paramount for, for, for many of us who um, are working with different teams, which is, you know, the balance between the, the needs that you have for your end users um, in, in Cindy, in your case, you know, loan recipients, Zach, in your case, you know, um, you know members of the JCC, you know, versus the, the, the needs that you have as the heads of your organizations for your, for your own organization and your own staff. And I think you, alluded, you both alluded to it, um, you know, a little bit, and I think you did as well, Joy, and just how you're, how you're, how you're managing that, that, that balance and that, and, and that challenge. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in, Barry. Thanks for the question. Um, Look, this is what we do every single day, right? Balancing the needs of our community and how we fill those needs with how we provide for those needs based on the staff and the resources that the DJ can provide. So for example, we know that because the economy has been hit so hard, there's gonna be a lot more need in our community next year. So how do we provide a preschool experience? How do we provide a camp experience? How do we provide an after school experience? Knowing that there's gonna be so much more scholarship need and yet we know that many of the philanthropists, many of you, many of the funders, you're also, you've also been hit that hard or harder this year, right? So uh, how do we provide a safe school environment, Barry, where, look, the county has said you can't have more than 10 kids in a classroom. And yet we still have ratios, so we have to have at least two teachers. And if you want to give a teacher a break, you have to have a third teacher in the classroom as a floater. But you can't have a floater going to multiple classrooms, otherwise they're going to bring the potential contagion with them, right? So now you have a self-contained unit of three teachers with 10 kids. The, the financial model just doesn't work the way it used to. So how do we run a viable preschool when that's what the community really needs? So you got the needs of the community. Everyone's saying, take my kids, please, so I can get my work done. But the reality is, how do you, how do you run a viable preschool unless you're going to have tremendous fundraising help to fill this gap? So that's a, an example of how you balance those two. Cindy, any thoughts on that one? I think, I think Zach is right. This is something we do always. We're always looking at how we keep our team going and keep them motivated, keep them feeling fulfilled and rested. And while we balance that with the needs of the community, which in our case, it's a very singular mission of providing uh, people with the opportunity to become, become and remain self-sufficient by offering them interest-free loans. I have an amazing dedicated team. I had somebody who was in the hospital actually doing loan interviews from her hospital room. I had staff people who've been working 16 to 18 hours a day, trying to help them feel connected with each other while working remotely. It's such a different thing compared to Zach where he had to lay a lot of people off or furlough them and he's dealing with hundreds. I made it a point initially the first few weeks of checking in with every member of my eight person team on a daily basis and making sure they're doing okay. Everybody was facing the same kinds of concerns that everyone on this call was during those, um, those early days, especially um, just the reality of the shelter in place setting in, making sure that they were able to function appropriately while feeling um, not so put upon that they couldn't, that they couldn't function. So we just did what we needed to do. You know, you motivate and you respond and you try to think ahead and get help from others. 
Uh, Joy, I mean, there are two questions that have come in. I mean, you can react to that one too. And there's also two questions that have quickly come in and over, you know, quickly running out of time, but are related to the kind of the donor aspect of it. Um, you know, one is related to your mention that, you know, you've, you've been encouraged by the amount of people that have stepping, stepped in and, you know, um, are you seeing more of that going to kind of general operating support? And, you know, is that, a, is that do you think that just might be temporary if that is the case? And then the second question, just, um, you know, other, other things that you're seeing from other communities, um, you know, somebody's asked a question around, is it your sense that other communities are using, are, are using similar approaches or, or different ones and things that you're hearing from your, your federated colleagues around the country? Yeah, that's it. Those are great questions. So thank you. I, you know, I do see that people are making lots of general operating support grants. I hope they will continue to do it, but be thinking about it in the, you know, the context of their giving as a whole, how they support leadership, how they support capacity of institutions. I think it's a good practice, one of the best practices in grant making when you really truly care about an organization to be thinking about it in general. I do spend, um, there are about 135 other Jewish community federations around North America, the top 19. Um, are the large ones. Um, ours is in, our federation is included in that. And I'm on a weekly call with my colleagues who have similar functions. Um, Danny um, Grossman, who's our CEO, is on similar calls with other execs as well as planning teams. So we take all the best practices around the country to try and understand what's working. We lean on each other a whole lot to try and understand. I was speaking on a call though a couple of weeks ago with um, uh, another colleague of mine in, in um, Palm Beach and someone in Cleveland, and you know they were talking about activating their donor advised fund holders, which are um, uh, primarily only grant makers to their federation's annual campaign, and and don't do a whole lot more than that. And actually, they couldn't even um, contact all of their fund holders because they didn't have all of their email addresses. So for so many years. Uh, many of the, um, it, you know, endowments that include donor advised fund giving has been transactional. And I think what really um, is special to the work that we're doing through um, our advisory practice, Federation Philanthropy Partners, is building relationships with donors so that we can go to them and be in conversation with them about opportunities and challenges that the community is facing. And in fact, you know, one of the largest um, grants to our emergency fund at the Federation came from a donor advised fund holder who wasn't a giver to the Federation. Um, the family had a donor advised fund, but wasn't deeply involved with the work of the Federation. So I think it just shows you about um, how relationships are built and what that can look like over time. So I think, you know, in some ways we're ahead of the curve, but every community, every federation likes to say the same thing you do about foundations. If you've seen one funder or one foundation, you've seen one foundation or funder and, and the same can sometimes be true um, at federations. I do wanna say one thing about the previous question that also picks up on something Zach said, if you don't mind. You know, I, I um, to our credit, um, the leadership team led by Danny Grossman really started encouraging people to work from home early before the shelter in place took effect, which allowed us to continue operations um, without much, um, you know, intermission in, in that time period, which included tremendous work on the IT side and also for managers really making sure that people understood what their job would be when they got home and that it wouldn't be business as usual. So many of us, myself included, you saw well, you were doing introductions, maybe you didn't see this, but I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old at home with me, a seven-year-old who just turned seven, who's learning how to read. And there is like this fine distinction between do I work from home or do I work or, or am I living in the office? And I'm not really sure every day where I land. And I think, you know, Zach referenced the counting of the Omer and where we are in that. I think there's so many really wonderful Jewish values that I'm taking away from that and how we need to treat our employees, the essential teams that are going in the office to process checks. One of the one of the things that we did was make sure it was safe for them to go to the office. We had to spread it out, you know, their, their, their time in the office over a week. So it takes longer for things like checks to be processed because we want to make sure that we are using com 
compassion, humility, and loving kindness and treating our employees that way so that for the long haul, we can really uh, make sure that we help the community by getting money out the door and the other good work that we're doing. So I'm, I'm heartened to hear that we're also taking care of the employees who work for us. And um, one of the things that we did make sure that we did with the Hebrew Free Loan, and I think Cindy mentioned this, is that organizations like the JCC who were forced to furlough employees, they could all take advantage of these loan opportunities, regardless of the fact if they were Jewish, just by virtue of working in the Jewish community. So I think, you know, thinking about compassion, humility, leadership, these are all really great Jewish values that are coming into play through this crisis. And, and it's, some, it's, a, it's a takeaway for me that I hope um, we'll see endure. Uh, I know we're out of time. Um, so I'm just going to close by saying, I know there was another question up there, which we're not going to get to, but I just want to answer it, which, you know, was kind of partly going to be my closing, which is, you know, somebody has asked a question around, you know, funding gap analysis, you know, by geography, you know, about schools and synagogues and JCCs and, you know, whatever. And I know that uh, our colleagues at, uh, at the Federation um, are deep into that analysis and deep into that work to understand what some of the short term needs are and what some of the longer term needs may be. Um, and, you know, just uh, encourage uh, whoever asked that question and anybody else, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to reach out um, so that they can gain a better understanding on the, both the analysis and possible ways to be, uh, you know, to be helpful. Um, and then the other, the last thing I just wanted to say was just to, you know, thank, um, you know, Cindy and, 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 and Amy and Joy and Zach um, for, 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 for the enormity of the work that you're doing. In particular, not every, we're all working hard, not everybody is created equally in this moment. And I think a, a particular nod, if, if Amy and Joy don't mind, to, to Cindy and Zach, um, who are really delivering the work on a day-to-day -day basis. It is, it, is, it, is, it is different to ours, it is, it, it is more acute to ours, you know, right now, um, and they're living, you know, emergencies and dealing with people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And so on behalf of all of us on the call, uh, Cindy and Zach, uh, you certainly have our deepest gratitude and um, for doing the work that you're doing on a, on a daily basis. And with that, I'll pass it to uh, Deborah, I think, for some closing words. Excellent. And thank you so much, Barry, for all of your insights and, and words. Um, this is a beginning of a really important conversation. We are in this for the long haul together. And I'm excited to be out here on the West Coast at this time um, to work with my colleague, Sivia Schwartzgetzig, who I think many of you know. And we are both available to you and open to hearing any feedback or ideas that you have about future conversations as we move through this together. And I want to thank all of you. This will be available in as a video um, that you can review and share. I know there are a lot of really powerful ideas here and a lot of learning for all of us. So thank you everybody for being here. And again, I'm available. Thank you.